You're listening to Gullum Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at gullaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash gullaminstitute. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our lesson on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This week we're going to be talking about a very famous conversation that took place between the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and one of the leaders of Quraysh, uh, one of the key opponents to the message of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and a very prominent member of his society. So, currently, right now. Um, Chronologically uh, speaking, we're probably um, you know, discussing the end of the third, beginning of the fourth year of the seerah, the life of the Prophet Wasallam. Excuse me, we're, we're in the end of the third, beginning of the fourth year of prophethood from the life of the Prophet Wasallam. So this is, we're about in year four of the actual message and the preaching and the da'wah, the nubuwa. And at this point in time, there was a very interesting incident that took place. It's very well known, it's quite famous, but nevertheless, very, very remarkable. We have talked about at this time that, you know, the community was steadily and slowly growing. And more and more prominent members of society and community continued to join this message and join this cause. Um, and were continuing to join the ranks of the believers in the community of the Prophet ﷺ. We talked about, um, and, and actually one of the notes that I'll probably, one of the things I'll touch on a little bit later is, we talked about the conversion of Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib, Hamza radiallahu anhu, but even um, a lot of more of the famous accounts of the seerah, the famous historians who have documented the life of the Prophet wasallam say, Hamza radiallahu anhu accepted Islam in the fifth year of prophethood, um, but some classical historians and scholars of the seerah place his acceptance of Islam a little bit earlier in the seerah. So it just all depends, but we'll talk about this. But we talked about Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, we talked about a few outsiders continuing to come to Mecca and embrace Islam and accept Islam. We talked about how the community of the Prophet is 40 plus people at this time, many women, many children, uh, or, or youth rather I should say. There's many women, there are many youth and even older respected members of society like Abu Bakr and Uthman radiallahu anhum. At the same time now, the message is actually public. The Prophet ﷺ is going around preaching in the marketplace, knocking on doors. He is talking to people now. And this is a well-known documented fact. And because of that, the opposition to the Prophet ﷺ is also a public affair. And I also talked about, we, we, we discussed here how the opposition to the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims also took on a very public face um, by the name of Abu Jahl. So Abu Jahl, Abu al-Hakam, Amr bin Hisham, being a leader of Mecca and of Quraysh, decided to make it a personal cause to make the life of the Prophet ﷺ and the life of anyone who would dare to accept Islam and follow the Prophet ﷺ. He made it his personal life mission to make their lives as difficult as possible. And so all of this is going on. Now amidst all of this, we also talked about how there were a few public incidents. The Prophet ﷺ publicly conversing with all of Quraysh present, Banu Hashim particularly. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ, you know, being attacked a couple of times verbally and people trying to get aggressive with him. And that's when Abu Talib stepped in and kind of made it a public cause that rallied Banu Hashim behind the Prophet ﷺ saying that the honor and the dignity of our people and our tribe, our family is at stake here. Agree with Muhammad or disagree, that's a side issue. But this is still the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. This is still one of us, Banu Hashim. And we cannot tolerate any disrespect to the family, to the tribe. So Abu Talib very strategically used that, that tribal mentality for the protection of the Prophet ﷺ. We know about the situation of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu being, being, uh, having been beaten into a coma. And so there were different, different situations that were going on publicly at this time. One of the things, uh, one of the things we also talked about was how the Quraysh and the leaders of Quraysh came to Abu Talib and made a proposal. 
Why don't you tell your nephew to kind of calm things down a little bit? You know, just, just scale things back a little bit. And when Abu Talib called on the Prophet ﷺ and he said, My dear nephew, what are you doing? You're making trouble, they're complaining to me. Why are you making my life difficult? And the Prophet ﷺ felt so bad at troubling his uncle that he was in tears. And with tears in his eyes and his voice cracking with all of his heart and passion, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Ammi, my dear, dear beloved uncle, إِنَّهُمْ لَوْ وَضَعُوا الشَّمْسَ فِي يَمِينِي وَالْقَمَرْ فِي يَسَارِي لَنْ أَتْرُكَ أَمْرِي هَذَا That even if these people were to put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I would not stop doing what I've been told to do. حَتَّى until and unless that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يُظْهِرُهُ اللَّهُ That Allah has given this deen the prominence that is meant to achieve and result in or أَوْ أُهْلِكَ or I perish, I die trying to accomplish my goal. So I gotta do what I gotta do. And, and uh, Abu Talib at that time put his support behind the Prophet ﷺ. After that the Quraysh came back to Abu Talib with an even more preposterous proposal and request. Uh, we talked about this, how they brought a young man by the name of Imara, who was a very bright, young, intelligent, you know, kind of up and comer one of those, you know, uh, superstars of the community. A young superstar of the community, they brought him and they said, we'd like to propose a trade. You know, we know you're old and, you know, Muhammad is like a son to you and you have a lot of hopes pinned in him, you know, you have, you've pinned a lot of your hopes on him in terms of future leadership and taking care of the family, this and that. Well, what if we gave you an imara, he'd be officially like your son and you hand over Muhammad sallallahu to us. It's a trade. And Abu Talib was just completely just, just taken aback. He was baffled by the stupidity of the people. And even said to them, he goes, you people cannot be serious. What, what, what did you think coming here? Like, what did you think was going to be my response? So they've, they've tried this diplomacy. It's a very unfortunate form of diplomacy that seems to lack any intelligence. But nevertheless, this was their diplomacy. So they had, they had tried this a couple of times. But then they started resulting to violence and aggression. And when that wasn't working either, then what did they decide to do? So there's a very interesting narration that mentions the next course of action. And there are various um, different variations of the same narration that are mentioned in different books of hadith by different scholars of seerah and hadith. Um, and I'll share some of the variations with you. But the most detailed uh, version of the story is mentioned by uh, some of the scholars of uh, Hadith and Sirah. Um, and they mention, this is narrated by Jabir bin Abdullah. He says, اِجْتَمَعَ قُرَيْشٌ يَوْمًا That Quraysh got together, the leadership, the brain trust of Quraysh, they gathered together. And they said that who amongst us would be the most qualified, the most knowledgeable, the best at identifying magic or poetry or jinn possession or insanity, mental instability, who would be able to recognize these things the best? And they said because this man, Muhammad, فَرَّقَ جَمَاعَتَنَا وَشَتَّتَ أَمْرَنَا وَعَابَ دِينَنَا because this man has, you know, divided our community. He has belittled our way of life. And he has, you know, um, exposed the faults within our religion. Um, he's criticized our belief system. So what do we do? So basically in that council they said, مَا نَعْلَمُ أَحَدًا غَيْرَ عُجْبَةُ بْنَ رَبِيعَةً We don't know anyone who would be more qualified to identify if it is truly magic, or if it is poetry, or if it is just simple insanity. We don't know anyone else who would be better be able to see through these issues and be able to identify exactly what's going on more than Utba bin Rabi'ah, Abu al-Walid, Utba bin Rabi'ah who was a leader of Quraysh, and it's actually said about him, he was very wealthy, he was very politically influential, he was very well read, and the other thing about him was that he was very well traveled. It's said about Utbah bin Rabi'ah, that he was one of the few people in Mecca and Quraysh, who had stood in the court of all the major kings of, that, uh, of the world at that time. He had stood and conversed with the emperor of Rome, the emperor of Persia, the king of Abyssinia. He had been to all these major empires, and he had traveled the world basically. 
He had traveled the entire civilized world. So when somebody is that well traveled, it gives them a lot of, you know, a broad scope of, you know, reference and knowledge. So they said, you know, Utsbah bin Rabi'ah would be the most qualified amongst all of us. So they went to him and Anta ya Abal Wali, they said, it's you. I mean, we're turning to you. You're our last hope here. So it said that Utsbah bin Rabi'ah approaches the Prophet And he said, Ya Muhammad, Anta khayrun ama Abdullah. Fasakata Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fakala anta khayrun ama Abdul Muttalib. Fasakata Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he basically started, you know, emotionally trying to blackmail the Prophet ﷺ, trying to corner the Prophet ﷺ, and really use a line of reasoning or logic that's not fair. And he started saying, are you better or are forefathers better? Are you better than your own forefathers? Because, and, and uh, not to say that he's correct or incorrect, because we've talked about this in the earlier Sira sessions, that's a point of discussion and contention amongst the ulama, the scholars of the Sunnah, what exactly was the beliefs of, what were the beliefs of the father and the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. So we're not going to get into that discussion here, but even that shows here where the Prophet ﷺ remained quiet. He did not respond because he knew there was no point in responding to this man. So the Prophet ﷺ stayed quiet and then he goes on to say, إِن كُنْتَ تَزْعُمُ أَنَّ هَؤُلَاءِ خَيْرٌ مِنْكَ فَقَدْ عَبَدُوا الْآلِهَا الَّتِي عِبْتَ وَإِن كُنْتَ تَزْعُمُ أَنَّكَ خَيْرٌ مِنْهُمْ فَكَلِّمْ حَتَّى نَسْمَعَ قَوْلَكَ so he said that if you think that they were better than you, well, they used to worship these idols that you talk bad about. And if you think you're better than them, then talk. Let's hear what you have to say. Let us judge what you have to say. Inna wallahi ma ra'ayna sakhlatan qattu ash'ama ala qawmihi minka. We've never seen anybody be more of a trouble and a headache for their people more than you are. فَرَّقْتَ جَمَاعَتَنَا وَشَتَتَّ أَمْرَنَا وَعِبْتَ دِينَنَا وَفَضَحْتَنَا فِي الْعَرَبِ He said that, you know, same thing, you've, you've divided our community, you've, made, you know, you've humiliated us in front of all of the Arabs, you've mocked our way of life, our religion, our belief system. حَتَّى لَقَدْ طَارَ فِيهِمْ أَنَّ فِي قُرَيْشْ سَاحِرًا وَأَنَّ فِي قُرَيْشٍ كَاهِنًا وَاللَّهِ مَا نَنْتَظِرُ إِلَّا مِثْرَ صَيْحَةِ الْحُبْلَى أَنْ يَقُومَ بَعْضُنَا إِلَى بَعْضُ بِالصُّيُوفِ حَتَّى نَتَفَانَا أَيُّهَا الرَّجُلِ إِنْ كَانَ إِنَّ مَا بِكَ الْحَاجَةِ And he basically goes on to say that we're not going to wait for anything. We're done with you basically. We've had it up to here. We're completely done with you. Either you stop what you're doing now, and he, and he basically says that now people are starting to say, there is a magician, there is a soothsayer, there is a, uh, a possessed man amongst the Quraysh. And we're not gonna wait anymore. Now we're gonna raise up swords, and we're basically gonna take care of this once and for all. We're done dealing with you. But he said, جَمَعْنَا لَكَ حَتَّى تَكُونَ أَغْنَى Quraysh رَجُلًا But we don't want it to get to that. So I'm here with an offer for you. We have gathered enough wealth from all the wealthy people in Mecca and Quraysh. We've created a fund. We've gathered enough wealth together to make you the wealthiest man in Mecca. Like officially, statistically, officially speaking. Forbes, right? We'll, we'll make you the wealthiest man in Mecca, documented. You'll be the wealthiest man of Quraysh. We've created the fund, it's right here. Ready to just sign it off to you. Just sign the dotted line. All we need is for you to quit this foolishness. We'll raise swords. But we don't want it to get to there. So why don't you just sign this document right here. Piece of paper. You become the richest man in Quraysh. And everybody walks away happy. It's a win-win situation. He says, وَإِن كَانَ إِنَّمَا بِكَ الْبَاءَ فَاخْتَرْ أَيَّ نِسَاءِ إِنْ قُرَيْشِ إِتَى He goes, maybe you don't want money. Maybe there's something else that you want. And if it's something else that you want, then we'll line up the most beautiful women that we can find in, in Mecca. And you take whoever you want, as many as you want. If that's what you want. He said, فَالْنُزَوِّجْكَ عَشْرًا We'll marry you to ten of the most beautiful women in Mecca. And he started, kept making these offers and told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, come on, waiting for you now, balls in your court. So the Prophet has been quiet this entire time. And he said, Are you done? 
That's it? You've said what you wanted to say? He said, Naam, that's all I had to say. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. So the Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم next said, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ That I, I begin by seeking the help of Allah who is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the abundantly merciful, the constantly merciful. And he begins to read and recite. And the Prophet ﷺ says, ha Of course these are the disjointed letters, only Allah knows best what they exactly mean. But that's part of the objective here. ha And it gets Abu walids attention. This is a very eloquent, well-read, well-educated man. So he's caught off guard. He finds it kind of interesting. ha Tanzilum min ar-Rahman rahim This is being sent down from, a, from the abundantly and constantly merciful. Kitabun fussilat ayatuhu Qur'anan arabiyan liqawmin ya'lamun This is a book that has been laid out in great detail. It has been expounded upon. Qur'anan arabiyan It is a Qur'an, that which is meant to be read. It is in the Arabic language originally. And it is meant for a people who want to learn, who have the capacity and the ability to understand and learn. Reflect. Bashiran wa nadiran. This book, this Quran, these ayat, it congratulates, encourages, and motivates, it inspires and lifts people up. Nadiran, it warns people. Fa'arada aktharuhum fahum la yasma'un. Most of the people turn away from it. But that's because they don't even bother to listen to it. If they sat down and actually attentively listened to it, they wouldn't turn away from it. But the fact that they turn away from it is an indication of the fact they're not even listening. وَقَالُوا قُلُوبُنَا فِي أَكِنَّةٍ مِمَّا تَدْعُونَا إِلَيْهِ And they say our hearts are covered up in a, in a seal. And akinna actually means like the, the peel of a fruit. That's not like an iron seal. The peel of a fruit is very delicate. You can literally rip it off with your hands, with your fingers. You can bite right through it. So they say our hearts are enveloped, like inside the peel of a fruit. And that's why what you're calling us to, we, we can't understand what you're talking about. وَفِي آذَانِنَا وَقْرٌ And our ears seem to be blocked. وَمِن بَيْنِنَا وَبَيْنِكَ حِجَابٌ and there's something that is obstructing, something that stands between us and between you. فَعَمَلْ إِنَّنَا عَامِلُونَ So you go do what you have to do, and let us do what we gotta do. You mind your own business, we'll mind our own business. Everybody do what they gotta do. قُلْ You say to them in response to this, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Listen, I'm one of you, I'm just, I'm just like the rest of you. I'm a human being. Yuha ilay. But there's one primary difference. I receive direct communication from Allah. Annama ilahukum ilahun wahid. That's your Lord, your Rabb, your deity, your God. The object of your worship needs to be one alone, Allah. Fastaqimu ilay. So stand up and be attentive to Him. Serve Him. Wastaghfiru. And turn back to Him and seek repentance and forgiveness from Him. وَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ And how unfortunate and sad and pathetic are those people who actually associate partners to Allah. الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةِ وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ كَافِرُونَ And those same people who associate partners to Allah, a sign of the darkness that lives within their heart is the fact that they are not socially, in, uh, they are not socially aware. They don't, they don't give charity, they don't serve their own communities, they don't realize the plight of less fortunate amongst them. وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ كَافِرُونَ And those people, they specifically completely deny belief in the life of the hereafter. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ أَجْرٌ غَيْرُ مَمْنُونَ But contrary to that, those people who believe in Allah, and then they do good deeds in order to become closer to Allah, reserved for them is a reward that will never end. It will begin in this world, and it will continue for all of eternity into the life of the hereafter. قُلْ أَإِنَّكُمْ لَتَكْفُرُونَ بِالَّذِي خَلَقَ الْأَرْضَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ Tell them, say to them, 
that do you people really actually deny and disbelieve in the one who created the earth in only two days? And by the way, this, this, I don't want to get into detailed tafsir here, but this, this meaning of creating the earth in two days, it, it, number one, obviously, it's a huge accomplishment to create everything you see in two days. But we know about Allah as believers, kun fayakun. Then what does it mean for Allah to create the earth in two days? That for Allah to actually put two days into creating the earth is ikraman. Ikraman li ahlil ard. It actually shows care and diligence and particularness, preparing this earth. You know, when you show up at a guest to someone's house, and they say that they've been cooking for two days, even though it's very easy, you want to feed a guest, you just take out. You call a restaurant two hours before, call them 20 minutes before, give them a call. I don't want to give an endorsement to any restaurant here locally, but you just call up any restaurant here locally and you just tell them like, hey, you know, I got some guests coming over. I need some chicken tikkas and some biryani. And they say, all right, pick it up in 45 minutes. And you show up and you pick up your food and you put out a spread. Your guests don't know any better about it. Done. They're happy. They get food and it's good food. But when somebody's been cooking straight for two days, nonstop, think about how honored you feel, how respected you feel. Ikram. So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this earth for two days, Allah prepared it for us. This is ikram min Allah. What more could we ask for? Karramna bani Adam. Allah has dignified and honored the human being. So He says He created the earth for you for two days. And then after all of that, you go and you create partners for Him, equals to Him. ذَٰلِكَ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ He alone is the lone creator, sustainer, provider, and protector of everything that's in the creation of Allah. Everything that's in existence. وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا رَوَاسِيَ مِن فَوْقِهَا وَبَارَكَ فِيهَا وَقَدَّرَ فِيهَا أَقْوَاتَهَا فِي أَرْبَعَةِ أَيَّامِ سَوَاءً لِلسَّائِلِينَ and that then after creating the earth for two days, then Allah put mountains down into the earth. He firmly set down mountains on top of its surface to hold this earth in place. وَبَارَكَ فِيهَا And then He blessed this earth. وَقَدَّرَ فِيهَا أَقْوَاتَهَا And then he, he fixed and determined and put in and planned all the sustenance for all of His creation within that same earth. فِي أَرْبَعَةِ أَيَّامِ For four days. سَوَاءً لِلسَّائِلِينَ And this is information for anyone who wants to know. Let them know. This is open information. Allah is telling you He did this. For four days after creating the earth for two days, for four days He just adorned the earth and prepared the earth so that you could comfortably live on the earth. ثُمَّ اسْتَوَىٰ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ And then He raised Himself above the heavens. وَهِيَ دُخَانٌ And the heavens at that time was a smoke. فَقَالَ لَهَا وَلِلْأَرْضِ اِئْتِيَا طَوْعًا أَوْ كَرْهًا and then he commanded the earth and the heavens. Then now come and prostrate and bow down before Allah. Submit yourself to the will of Allah. Either do it willingly or you're going to have to do it unwillingly because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator and everything is submissive to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls everything. So he told the heavens and the earth, you will now listen to me and you will obey me and you will, tell, you will do what I tell you to do. And you can either do this willingly or unwillingly and what happened? قَالَتَا قالت أَتَيْنَا طَائِعِينَ And both the heavens and the earth said, Oh Allah, we come willingly and we bow down before you and we are submissive and obedient to your command. فَقَضَاهُنَّ سَبَعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He completed the heavens as seven different stages, seven heavens, seven levels of the sky in two days. وَأَوْحَا فِي كُلِّ سَمَاءٍ أَمْرَهَا and then he gave each of the levels of the heavens its command and its role and its objective. وَزَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحَ And then Allah says that He took the lowest of the skies and the heavens and He adorned it and decorated it with these stars that you see brining, shining brightly in the sky like lanterns and lanterns that are glowing at the time of the night. حِفْظًا 
And he put them there as protection. How are they protection? They provide guidance and direction. We even know where to travel and where we're going and where we're situated, situated even at night time. And all of this was determined and fixed by the one who is fully powerful and overpowering and dominating and the one who is all-knowing. فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا so if these people after all of this, if people after all of this, they continue to turn away and neglect and ignore, intentionally turn away and ignore this truth and this reality, فَقُلْ Then you tell them, أَنذَرْتُكُمْ I've warned you. I've warned you. What have I warned you about? صَاعِقَةً I've warned you about a punishment. Sa'iqa has a lot of different interpretations in classical Arabic. It can refer to like, like, a fire, like a ball of fire. It can refer to like a thunderbolt. But a very destructive force is what it basically amounts to. Like imagine a ball of fire, just a very destructive force. I have warned you of a very great destructive force. مثل sa'iqati adin wa thamud. Just like the destructive force that came and obliterated the people of Ad and the people of Thamud, who were from the Arabs, whose ruins were not too far away from Mecca, and that the Arabs were very familiar, and especially somebody as educated and traveled and, and uh, sophisticated as Utbah, as Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, he would know about this very, very well. And he did. And the Prophet of Allah finally reached ayah number 13 from surah number 41 that I've warned you about a great destruction that could come upon you just like it came upon the people of Ad and Thamud. And as soon as the Prophet of Allah وسلم, reached this ayah, the narration says that Utbah, there are two different narrations. One narration says that he started screaming, Hasbuk, Hasbuk. Hasbuk, hasbuk, which means please stop, please stop. Hasbuk, hasbuk, please stop, please stop. Ma indaka ghayru hadha? Isn't there anything else you could say to me besides this? Because he's panicking, he's, 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 he's very nervous, he's scared. And the Prophet of Allah said, La, that's my message to you. One other narration says, actually in the narration that Utbah himself is speaking in the first person, he actually goes back to Quraysh and says that I reached across and placed my hand on the mouth of Muhammad. I reached out and grabbed him, grabbed, placed my hand on his mouth. And I said, please stop. Qif, qif ya Muhammad. Uskut ya Muhammad. Please stop, be quiet. Because I was afraid that if he would have kept on going, that that azab, that punishment from the sky would have come down right where I was standing. It would have come down on me. And he says, and when the people said, what's wrong with you? We sent you there to go and get him quiet. And you come back with your tail between your legs, scared and terrified, talking about how scared you are of what Muhammad said. And he said, Muhammad has never lied. Muhammad has never lied. And I've, I've been a, around the world. I've traveled across the world. I've met the greatest poets of this era. The greatest magicians on earth. The greatest soothsayers. The most eloquent speakers. I've met all these people. I've sat with these people. I've heard these people. I've talked to these people. And what I heard was none of that. It was something else completely. It was not from this earth. And he says, Hasbuk, Hasbuk, please stop ya Muhammad. He goes back to his people, فَرَجَعَ إِلَىٰ قُرَيْشِ فَقَالُوا مَا وَرَاءَكَ And some of the narrations actually say that when he was returning back to Quraysh, they looked at his face and they said that he's coming back looking different. This is not the same man who went there to talk to Muhammad, this is somebody else. And they said, what happened? What's there? Why do you look like this? And he said, and he responds to him, he says, مَا تَرَكْتُ شَيْئًا أَرَىٰ أَنَّكُمْ تُكَلِّمُونَهُ حَتَّى كَلَّمْتُهُ he says, I said everything you wanted me to say to him. فَهَلْ أَجَابَكْ Did he respond to you? He said, نَعَمْ ثُمَّ قَالْ لَا وَالَّذِي نَصَبَهَا بَنِيَّةً مَا فَهِمْتُ شَيْئًا مِمَّا قَالَ غَيْرَ أَنَّهُ أَنْذَرَكُمْ 
Sa'iqatan misra sa'iqati adin wa thamud. One narration says that they said, did he respond? Well, what did he say? He goes, he goes, I swear, I didn't understand a single word what he had to say. All I can remember, all I can recall is that he's warning you that a punishment like that, like the one that came upon the people of Ad and Thamud will come upon you. That's all I know. That's all I came back with. And the people basically were very disheartened and they turned away from there. There are other narrations where he says, فَأَمْسَكْتُ بِفِيهِ I put my hand on his mouth. When I shut to الرَّحِمْ أَنْ يَكُفَّ And I told him, for the sake of our relationship, for the sake of your own family members, please stop. وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا إِذَا قَالَ شَيْئًا لَمْ يَكْذِبْ فَخِفْتُ أَنْ يَنْزِلَ عَلَيْكُمْ الْعَذَابِ And you people know when Muhammad speaks, he doesn't lie. I was afraid that a punishment would descend down upon you right where you're standing. There are other narrations in which he goes on to comment and talk about you know, what had transpired and what exactly occurred. One of the narrations says that where Abu Jahl actually hears about this whole situation. And Abu Jahl comes to him and he says, and this man is an elder even to Abu Jahl. This is somebody that even Abu Jahl respects. And he says, Ya Ammi, inna qawmaka yuriduna in yajma'ulaka ma'lan. And he said that, um, قال لي ما قال ليعطوكه فإنك أتيت محمد لتعرض لما قبله. He said that when 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 Utba came back from the Prophet and he was so stricken and so terrified and so overwhelmed that he literally would not even respond to the people. He was in the days and he just kind of walked away from there. That the news and everybody was like confounded. Everyone was confused. What what, what just happened? That when Abu Jahl found out, Abu Jahl said, I got to do some damage control. Because the word around Mecca was, the word around Mecca started to spread that maybe Utbah also believes in what the Muhammad says now. Utbah believes in what Muhammad says now. So Abu Jahl comes to him in one narration, he says that, Inna, inna qawmaka azamu annaka qad sabata. That your own people think that you have forsaken your own religion. The religion of our forefathers. In one narration, he actually comes to him and he goes, your people have gathered together and gathered a bunch of money together and they would like to give it to you as a gift. And he's like, why? He's like, you know, they, they want to make sure that you're okay because it seems like you're not the same since you spoke to Muhammad. So they want to make sure everything's okay and they want to look out for you and they want to give you a gift. Basically code word for a bribe. They want to make sure that you're okay. And Utbah, says to Abu Jahl, he goes, what am I going to do with their money? I'm wealthier than any of them. I got more money than all of them put together. I don't need their money. And he said, then what's wrong with you? He says, قَدَ عَلِمَتْ قُرَيْشَ أَنِّي مِنْ أَكْثَرِهَا مَالًا I'm wealthier than all of them. So he said, فَقُلْ فِيهِ قَوْلًا يَبْلُوا قَوْمَكَ أَنكَ أَنَّكَ مُنْكِرٌ لَهُ He says, then, at the, then he goes, if you don't want their money, you won't accept their gift. He said, you have to say something. You have to say something that can be put out as, as an official press release to the rest of Quraysh that Utbah disapproves of Muhammad. Utbah does not believe in Muhammad. Utbah rejects what Muhammad has to say. You got to say something. He said, وَمَاذَا أَقُولُ What do you want me to say? What am I supposed to say? فَوَاللَّهِ مَا مِنْكُمْ رَجُلٌ أَعْلَمَ بِالْأَشْعَارِ مِنِّي he goes, there is not a single person amongst you who knows poetry better than I do. وَلَا أَعْلَمَ بِزَجْرِهِ Nobody amongst you knows, you know, rhyming and poetry and eloquence better than I do. وَلَا بِقَصِيدِهِ مِنِّي Nobody knows how to write poetry better than I do. وَلَا بِأَشْعَارِ الْجِنْ Nobody knows the poetry, and the, which basically refers to black magic. Nobody knows the poetry of the jinns better than I do. وَاللَّهِ مَا يُشْبِهُ الَّذِي يَقُولُ شَيْئًا مِنْ هَذَا He goes, what this man Muhammad had to say was nothing like poetry, was nothing like magic, was nothing like soothsaying. It was, no, it was unlike anything I've ever heard before in my life. وَاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لق, إِنَّ لَقَوْلَ إِنَّ لَقَوْلِهِ الَّذِي يَقُولُهُ حَلَاوَةً وَإِنَّ عَلَيْهِ لَطَلَاوَةً وَإِنَّهُ لَمُثْمِرٌ أَعْلَاهُ مُدْغِقٌ أَسْفَلُهُ وَإِنَّهُ لَيَعْلُوا وَلَا يُعْلَى عَلَيْهِ وَإِنَّهُ لَيَحْطِمُ مَا تَحْتَهُ He goes on to describe 
And just even how he expresses his thoughts on the Qur'an are beautiful, powerful, eloquent words. He says that, That what this man Muhammad said to me, it had a certain sweetness to it. Unlike anything I've ever tasted in my life. And it had this, 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 this sooth, it had a soothing feeling to it. It was very soothing. It was sweet and soothing. He goes, it's like something that the top of it has fruits. He's giving the analogy of a big, beautiful, powerful tree. He says that the top of the tree bears fruits. And its roots are very deep and firm and strong. And it overcomes and it is not overcome or taken over or defeated by anything. Intellectually speaking, it supersedes everything. And nothing can overcome it or defeat it. And it crushes anything that it steps on. Meaning you present any type of reasoning or logic before it, it'll crush it, it'll annihilate it. He said that, listen, I'm just gonna tell you right now, if you don't have something other than what you just said to me, if you don't have something else to say, your people will reject you. Everything you've accomplished, everything you've worked for in your entire life, all this honor and dignity and nobility and respect, everything will be gone. Your people will not accept you if you don't have something otherwise to say. He goes, then leave me. Let me think, I gotta give this some thought. When he had thought about it for some time and he realized what was at stake. You see, he didn't feel any differently about the Qur'an. He didn't feel any differently about Muhammad Rasulullah He didn't feel any differently about this message or what he had heard. But he realized what he would have had to give up. He saw Abu Bakr being beaten to a bloody pulp in the haram itself. He saw Uthman bin Affan being chained up and tortured. He saw Ammar and Yasir and Sumayya, a family being strung up and tortured to death. He saw all of this. And he realized what he would have been giving up. And he was not willing to make the sacrifice for the truth. So he comes out to give a public statement. And everyone gathers together. And he says, هَذَا سِحْرٌ يُؤْثَرٌ because he had, to, he had to explain. Not only did he have to explain what he thought about the message of Muhammad, he had to explain why it took him a couple of days. Why he looked so dazed. Why he went into seclusion. Why he isolated himself from everyone. Why did Abu Jahl have to come in and do damage control? People were watching all of this. So he had to explain all of this. So he comes out and he says, هَذَا سِحْرٌ يُؤْثَرْ يَأْثُرُهُ عَنْ غَيْرِهِ he says, this is magic. هذا سِحْرٌ This is magic. يُؤْثَر But it's not normal magic. It's not like this little silly trickery. It's not like David Blaine where he's got a card trick. Where he puts himself in a box for like 50 days or something crazy like that. هذا سِحْرٌ يُؤْثَر This is magic that messes with you. This is magic that gets into your head. This is magic that has an effect on you. It messes with you. So that's what happened. I was recovering from Muhammad's overpowering magic. So you gotta understand, that's what was going on. هذا سحر يؤثر And it affects other people. That's what he does. He goes around and he goes, all these other people that are following him, they're not as strong as I am. You know I'm the strongest amongst you. You know I'm the most educated and the most smartest and the most intelligent amongst you. Right? So I was able to overcome it. It took me a few days there. I was under the weather for a few days. It was messing with my head for a couple of days, but I got through it. That's only because I'm genetically, intellectually superior. But all the rest of these followers, they're sheep. They're not able to overcome Muhammad's magic. So that's my official statement. 
When the Prophet of Allah heard this, he was hurt. He was sad. He was distraught. He's like, these, these people, they don't get it. Because when he was reciting, he saw literally the colors of his face changing. He saw it penetrating into his heart. He saw the look in Utbah's eyes when Utbah reaches out and grabs his mouth and he says, Please stop. Please stop. Take it back. He saw it and the Prophet ﷺ was hopeful. So he's very distraught. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayat in Surah Al Muddathir, Surah number 74. Leave me and the one that I've created, leave me and him alone. You know when somebody messes with you and somebody else steps in to kind of get your back and they say, listen, why don't you go ahead? Why don't you leave us here? We have something to talk about. Right? We have a little talking to do. Right? Why don't you let us talk? We'll take care of things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Dharni wa man khalaqtu wahidan. Why don't you, you go ahead, you do what you gotta do. Why don't you leave me and him alone? I'll take care of him. وَجَعَلْتُ لَهُ مَالًا مَمْدُودًا I gave him a lot of money. وَبَنِينَ shuhudan. And I gave him a lot of children, a lot of family who will all be witnesses against him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I'll take care of him. You don't worry. You do what you have to do. Let me deal with him. Let me take care of him. And this is basically that famous story of Utbah bin Rabi'ah, Abu al-Walid, one of the great leaders of Mecca and of Quraysh, and exactly what transpired between him and the Prophet ﷺ. And this was a very critical moment because this was Quraysh again. This was Quraysh after they had already started to, I, I should say it this way, all of Quraysh, the whole city of Mecca had not resorted to violence yet. People like Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab had. But that's because they were... You know, they, that's because they were, very simply put, bad people. They were violent, aggressive, bad people. Almost like somebody kind of looking for an excuse to just hurt someone. So they were looking for an excuse to harm someone, hurt someone. So they welcomed the opportunity. But the rest of Makkah, the rest of Quraysh was like, listen, there's got to be a solution here. And they finally went to Utbah bin Rabia, Abu walid And he said, you're our last hope. And when this finally transpired with Utbah bin Rabia, then it became well known in Mecca. We've exhausted all of our avenues. We've exhausted everything that was available to us. It boils down to one thing. We're going to have to muscle these people. We're going to have to strong arm these people. These people are not willing to listen. We're going to have to deal with these people the harsh way. And it kind of set in. And at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ also realized that this leadership of Quraysh and this leadership of Mecca, that they, there's something else other than the truth that is more important to them. Their power, their dignity, their honor, their wealth, their money, their respect is a lot more important to them than everything else, than anything else. And these people are not about to listen. They don't care about the truth. They know it's the truth. Utbah is looking me at, in the face, looking me in the eyes. And I can tell that he knows that this is the truth. He all but says it straight out. But there's, these people have something else that's more important. They have other priorities in life. And the Prophet ﷺ realized this at this moment as well. And from here on out, things in Mecca would start to take a turn for the worse. Things in Mecca would start to take a turn for the worse. And basically torture and oppression and aggression and violence would become the public policy of Quraysh would become the official state public, publicly accepted you know, procedure and practice and policy of all of Quraysh and of all of Mecca. And that would lead to a great event that would take place towards the end of the fourth year of prophethood of Nubuwa. And that was the first time migration would occur. When Muslims in an organized fashion, with actual approval and approval and instruction from the Prophet of Allah would leave Mecca 
simply solely to protect their lives and to continue to live and practice their faith and their deen and their religion, this would occur. The migration to Abyssinia, to Habasha would occur in the same year because of things finally getting to this point and that's basically something we're gonna talk about next. One of the last things that I wanted to mention is one of the other variations that um, some of the other uh, scholars of Sirah and Hadith mention, it's a weaker narration, but nevertheless they mention that one of the verses that the Prophet of Allah recited to Utbah when, when, he, you know, when Utbah came to challenge him, one of the verses the Prophet ﷺ recited that just left Utbah dumbfounded, quiet, like just he didn't know what to say in response to that, was that very powerful, beautiful ayah from Surah An-Nahl. Surah An-Nahl, Surah number 16, ayah number 90, that we hear the Khatib recite every single Friday. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan wa ita'i dil qurba. That Allah continues to command and enjoin upon you. Al-adl, justice, balance in life. Wal-ihsan, and striving for excellence. wa ita'i dil qurba, and preserving and protecting the institution of family and home. So God enjoins upon you justice, balance in society, striving for excellence in everything that you do. And number three, protecting and preserving the institution of family and home. وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِي And he tells you to stay away from three things. الْفَحْشَاء Shamelessness. Lewdness, shamelessness. وَالْمُنْكَرِ And social evils reprehensible, inappropriate behavior, ill treatment of one another. Munkar does, can refer to sins in general, but when you look at the Arabic language and you look at the etymology of the word, and you compare it to the synonyms that are also used for evil or sins, you realize that ma'roof and munkar. Munkar is the antonym, is the opposite of ma'roof. Ma'roof and munkar refer to social ills, social goods and social ills. So it's literally speaking about akhlaq and character, how you treat people. So he tells you to stay away, he prohibits you, he's warning you, stay away from shamelessness, lewdness, shamelessness. Number two, munkar, socially reprehensible behavior. And number three, al-baghi. Al-baghi is rebelliousness, anarchy, lawlessness in society. So you see it works the other way around. You see how the three topics build. It started with social justice, balance. It started striving for excellence in, the, in, in your life, in the way you conduct yourself, the way you live. Being the most excellent human being possible. And number three, family and home. And then it begins by shamelessness. Because that obliterates the home and the family. Number two, it talks about Munkar, socially reprehensible behavior, which because that's the opposite of ihsan. And number three, it says lawlessness, rebelliousness, no balance, no order in society. He warns you to stay away from it. He's commanding you stay away from these three things. يَعِذُكُمْ your Lord, your Master, Allah, your Rabb, your Creator, He advises you. And the word wa'av means to very lovingly, gently, kindly advise. That's why when it talks about Luqman giving his son advice, وَوَيَعِذُهُ الْوَعَضِ So your Lord advises you, lovingly, gently, kindly advises you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ So that maybe you learn a lesson, you'll pay attention, you'll actually listen and learn something. You'll pay attention, you'll realize, you'll recognize the truth and the reality. That the Prophet of Allah recited this verse and it was so comprehensive and so powerful that it literally left the utbah just speechless. And he didn't know what to say or what to respond. Because it was so comprehensive and so powerful. So one of the narrations also mentions this ayah. Now, in the previous session, last week's session, I ended by telling the story of Dimad. And 
even before that, we talked about the story of Abu Dhar, Ghifari radiallahu anhu. This week we're talking about the story of Utbah bin Rabi'ah. I wanted to mention these stories back to back. The reason is Abu Dhar Ghifari, when he comes to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu the Prophet sallallahu recites the Qur'an to him. And he realizes this is unlike anything else on this earth. It's not man-made, it's not human. This is divine. And what is this? And Abu Dhar is an intelligent man, one of the most intelligent men of his people. There's another story about Tufail. We talked about the story of Tufail quite a few sessions ago. Tufail from the tribe of Adaus. He was literally considered a genius of his people. Like a Nobel Prize winning scientist. He was a genius of his people. He was Einstein. When he visited Mecca, he was such, it was such a big deal for him to visit Mecca that all the leaders of Mecca and Quraysh came out to welcome him. Because you had literally one of the leading like intellectual minds of your time visiting your city. So it was a big deal. And they specifically also kind of said, you know, we got a little bit of a PR disaster on our hands right now in Mecca. You know, Muhammad, he's kind of doing these things. You might hear about it or this and that, just please just ignore it and stay away from it. And that's why, we talked about this, that's why they told him, just don't listen to him. Because it seems to be when he talks to people, it like has an entrancing, like it entrances people. It has this weird like magical effect on people. And then they just lose their intelligence and lose their, their, their rationale and their thought. And that's why when Tufail saw the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ was very, you know, very, you know, kind and gentle in his, in his presence. I said, this man doesn't look evil. But he's like, but wait a second. They said, you know, he has this effect on people. And then Tufail's confidence, his intellect actually gave him confidence where he said, come on Tufail, all these silly little like, you know, desert dwellers running around here in Mecca, they're afraid of his words. But you're, you're Einstein, you're a genius. What are you worried about? You'll be able to see nonsense for nonsense. And truth for truth, you're, in, you're a genius. And when he sat down with the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ recited the Qur'an, اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ ربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم To fail was a changed man. And he believed, أَشَدْ وَلَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَّكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ He believed. Genius of his time. Abu Dhar Ghifari, very intelligent, sophisticated, experienced man. Believed. Dimad, great leader of his people. Believed. We talked about the story. The Prophet ﷺ recited the khutbah al Haja. The opening introduction to a lecture or a talk. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu. Dhimad said, read it again, say it again. He recited it again, he said, say it again. He said it again, he said, say it again. He said it again, he said, I believe. Give me your hand, I want to hold your hand and tell you I believe that you are the messenger of God. That's one reaction. And you see another reaction here from Utbah. Utbah heard 13 ayat of a powerful portion of the Qur'an. Surah number 41, Surah Fusilat. And he knew he was listening to the truth. But he didn't accept, he didn't believe. So you see the two opposites. And one of the lessons that we take home from this, is that the words of Allah and the words of the Messenger of Allah are presented to us as well. We read them, we see them, we hear them, we come across them. But what effect does it have on us? When you're listening to it, you know you're hearing the truth. Everyone obviously hears a believer or a Muslim. So you know it's the truth. But what is the realization of that? Do you hear and do you go, wow, amazing, awesome, great. But then what's the effect of it afterwards? Do I hear that? Do I read that? Do I listen to that and walk away? Th- and all I'm left with that is, man, he's a really great speaker. Man, that's a great YouTube video. Man, those are some awesome recordings. And that's it? Or is there a change in my life? Do I... Do, 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 do I change? Do I, do, do I change myself? Do I rise up to what it's asking of me? Do I stay away from what it's telling me, prohibiting me from doing? Does it cause a change? Does it have an effect, an impact on me or not? And that's gonna tell me whether I belong in the class of 
Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said something. He said even in the Quran when Allah talks about mushrikun and kafirun, there's a lesson and an ibra and a reminder for Muslims in that as well. Because fine, we might not be mushrik or kafir, but we can act a lot like kuffar and mushrikun. He said when Allah tells us what Fir'aun did, we might not be Fir'aun. But we can act a lot like Fir'aun sometimes unfortunately. May Allah protect us all. So we got to ask ourselves, am I acting like Abu Dhar, Ghifari, Tufayl al-Dawsi, Dimad, radiallahu anhum, may Allah be pleased with all of them. Or am I acting like Utbah bin Rabi'ah, Abu al-Walid? I got to ask myself that question. And that's a gauge for myself. And I have to be more like the first party, not like this second party right here. It has to have that impact and that change in me. And then the last little note I'll share with you is, this surah, surah number 41, surah Fussilat, that had this impact and that the Prophet ﷺ chose to present before Utbah bin Rabi'ah, the leadership of the opposition at that time. It's a very powerful surah. We actually, from uh, Qalam Institute, we actually did a course um, on the tafsir of Surah Fussilat. And uh, the objective of it is that w- f- from my teachers, when we learned the tafsir of the surah, what they told us is that the tafsir of Surah Fussilat, surah number 41, this is a course, a curriculum for minorities on how to do da'wah. This is a course, especially as a minority, how to do da'wah. Like da'wah in the West, da'wah as a minority cannot be done without the proper study of Surah number 41. It is a need and a necessity compulsory for every da'wah worker. For anyone who claims to be a believer and a propagator of this message, especially as a minority community, we have to read, we have to learn, we have to um, observe this surah. And it's very important. And we have recordings actually online um, that, that when we conducted the course, inshallah. So I advise everybody to go and access these recordings. And uh, again, inshallah, would definitely love to sit down and um, uh, conduct the tafsir of this surah and maybe present it with some more thoughts added to it. So inshallah, hopefully, that's something that we can... Um, execute and something we can do inshallah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard subhanallahi wa bihamdihi subhanakallahu bihamdik nashar wa la ilaha illa anta nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk